Welcome to Growth Track. Heartland Church, in partnership with North Central Indiana Bible College, is excited to offer this discipleship program that will include, encourage, educate, and inspire you to be the person God has created you to be. Growth Track is divided into tracks and modules that dive deep into faith, answer questions you have, and connect you with Jesus. Combined with recommended readings, opportunities to grow through service, and a community of believers on the same journey, your transformation is inevitable. If you would like to become a student and earn college credit for this class, go to heartland.church and click on the Growth Track page. There you can see the requirements, application, moral code, and other information about Growth Track. If you prefer to just view this class for your own information and growth, that's great, and we hope this helps you grow. Let's get started. Okay, so we're going to pick right up with uh, 1 Timothy structure. 1 Timothy starts with a greeting, and then it basically comes right out with warning against false teachers. And that's where it starts and ends, and it has a bunch of good content in the middle of it. 1 Timothy is loaded, loaded, loaded with a lot of practical stuff that really, it's one of those books you could read five times. There are some books where I like to sit there, and I can read them once a day, every day for 30 days, and I still get stuff at the end of 30 days out. 1 John's the same way for me. This is a really good book to go through that with. Um, six chapters long with this one, but it's really got a lot of good content. So he goes and talks about uh, false teachers, expresses thankfulness for grace and mercy, and attempts to help Timothy fight against these false teachings. And this book is really has a lot of mere images of what we are seeing today. Because there is a lot of false teaching going on in the churches in America, and you can tell false teaching except immorality. That's, that's hand in hand. And so this is directing it, and it's basically telling it, hey, we have to lovingly confront. And the nice thing is you get to see this, but you also get to see when he talks about how to do it, it's not the way you think it is. It's not with warfare. It's not by yelling them down. There is confrontation. But the always, the, you can always feel that Paul's underlying goal is in correction is to try to win back the person who's in error. You can win the argument but lose the person. And that's not Paul's goal here. And he wants that to not be Timothy's goal. So he attempts, uh, he uh, goes on in chapter 2 through 3, 16, gives further warning against false teachers, an exhortation toward uh, being persevering, moving, being steady. Uh, Paul includes instructions on how to treat various people within the church. Uh, there's an exhortation in prayer from 4 through 6, uh, particularly for leaders. That's a big contrast to what we hear today. There's nothing about criticizing leaders. Go figure that. Whether they're Republican or Democrat, there's nothing about criticizing them. It says to pray for them, to exhort them and pray over them, and addresses uh, appropriate behavior for those within the church. And there's another warning at, at the end of it, like I said, against false teachers as well as greed. Then Paul encourages Timothy to be strong and ends with a prayer for grace. So Timothy, from what we can see by the way Paul is addressing him, was it's very likely that he was a timid and pass a person and probably easily intimidate him. A lot of that had, may have been having to do with him being a younger person. Um, he could have been in his early 20s dealing with people who are, you know, pretty rough group and people who are into things for the wrong motives. And as we can see and we know when someone has the wrong motive in one area, that bleeds to a lot of areas. And a lot of times, uh, if they have a goal and they don't have God, they're going to use a lot of rough means to get that goal accomplished. And so Timothy was having to deal with this and learn how to do it, but still be a man of God while doing it. And so he was telling him that, uh, we can see that Paul repeatedly was telling him, hey, he was spurring him into action. One thing that Paul wasn't putting up with is any inactivity. And that could be for us too, right? God doesn't want inactivity. Inactivity causes atrophy. We have a lot of things in our, in our spiritual walk that are like muscles. Faith like a muscle. You don't exercise it, it atrophies. You exercise it, it grows. God's the one who feeds it. He's the one who increases it. But we've got we to gotta act on what we have, right? And he's telling them inactivity is not an option here. And like a good soldier, he has to fight the good fight of faith, aggressively protecting the gospel. Now, if that doesn't apply to today, I don't know what does. Aggressively protecting the gospel. We get into 1 Peter, it's going to really blow your mind how applicable it is today, but it's amazing how many people are more worried about offending others than offending God. Now, if you have a choice, you're not, if, you don't have, if you can choose to not offend them and not offend God, that's where you go. 
But if you have to choose between your vertical audience or your horizontal audience, pick the right audience. And that's kind of where Paul's going at with this too. Protect that gospel and spreading it while you're protecting it. So the theme of 1 Timothy is the problem of false teaching and the need for church order. Okay? So their false teaching is always a danger that threatens the church. Today, it's spreading more and more. I just heard of a church in Tennessee that was talking about how the Bible's not necessarily inspired Word of God. It's, a, it's one of the bigger churches and talking about how, um, you know, it's one of those things where we can kind of pick and choose. Again, this cafeteria-style Christianity. I like that, but I don't like that. Oh, that immorality. No, this is good. Oh, I can beat my neighbor over the head with this. No, it's kind of how things come across with. But there's, there's no love in that. And we can get in two sides of a ditch. We can get over inside a ditch where we don't want to offend anybody. We're all about love, love, love. And then we have, and we, and we have no effect. Or we get to all the way to the other side with truth, truth, truth. And we're beating the people over the head of the Bible, yelling and repent, and wondering why they're not running church. Speak the truth in love. I've said this before, and I've heard, I don't remember where her said, but it bears repeating. If you want the heart of God on the matter, you shouldn't tell someone to go into hell without a tear in your eye. And so, he's telling him that this is, uh, this is dealing with that false teaching, and many of Paul's letters deal with false teaching. You guys went through the part one where he talked about Galatians. There was false teaching there, a, a lot of things with the law. Um, that was false teaching there. This is more on the side of false teaching where you, you kind of, anything goes in some areas. And today, uh, false teaching confronts us on every side, and debates over doctrines, they're not new. Even Jesus dealt with them. All the time. You can't go through three or four series on Sunday mornings at Heartland without hearing about a, a debate that Jesus had over doctrine issues. We talk about it all the time because it happened all the time. Whether it's the Pharisees or the Sadducees, uh, there's just all kinds of issues that go on there. But throughout the centuries, Christians have been called to contend for the faith. And if we do not do it, that's when things happen. I'll tell you, one of the problems that, of the culture is when a generation before doesn't win the next generation, the things start to crumble fast. Well, here we're at the inception of the church, and Timothy has got the job of reaching this generation around, in a world around him that's already deprived, and the people who are reached are kind of uh, getting infiltrated by these false teachers. And Paul's getting his, uh, if I might use an old Western, he's getting his dander up a little bit here. He's getting mad a little bit. And he's telling him to go through this. So Paul knew that the young minister would need advice and encouragement, especially as opponents of orthodoxy arose. So orthodoxy, big word here. It's just the authorized or generally accepted uh, theory, doctrine, or practice of the church that was that they interpret the Bible with. So they looked at the Bible and everybody's pretty much agreement, this is what the Bible says, this is what it means, this is how we apply it. And then they would come in with this uh, fruity stuff to kind of twist it. They put a little truth in every lie that tickle their ears. So this is where he was writing to challenge the teachings and call for right order in the, in the church. So um, the way he did that is by setting things in order with good teaching good, solid teaching, and then starting putting, with that good, solid teaching, developing good, solid leadership. And so, I'm going to read some passages here and go through briefly on them. So, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through, uh, 1 Timothy 1, 3 through 10, this is Paul addressing, and when I left for Macedonia, I urge you to stay there in Ephesus and stop those who are teaching, whose teaching is contrary to the truth. Don't let them waste their time in endless discussion of myths and spiritual pedigrees. These things only lead to meaningless speculation, which don't help people who live a life of faith in God. Now, I love Paul for a big reason. So, uh, full disclosure here, I'm a very logical person. Anybody ever take those uh, Myers-Briggs test, MBTI? There is a part on there where you have feelings and logic, and you can go in the middle of zero, and then there's 100 this way, 100 that way. Every time I took it, and I've took it probably a dozen times, I score 100 on logic, and there's, it's like feelings are an afterthought. God gave me a family so I could know I had a beating heart. <laughs> and I do. <laughs> in other words, I would just think, I care a lot, I care deeply. I even cry at, at stupid movies. But the thing is, is, is when I go to make decisions, if it's not logical, I don't care about a feelings or emotions. I can have my heart going a million directions, but if it's not logical, I don't care. It's not the right decision. Paul comes across that way at times, but then Paul also has a lot of that human side and he has compassion in there. And I see that side with Jesus at times too. But Paul right here is just saying, hey, 
They don't, this stuff is worthless. Don't even mess with it. They're talking about genealogies. They're talking about stuff in Genesis and all that. It's worthless. Don't even bother with it. Don't waste your time. Don't breath, waste your breath. Don't even argue with them. It's not even worth saying, this, saying that they're wrong because just don't mess with it. Now that's, that speaks to me. That's perfect. Don't mess with it. I can do that. Then in verse 5 is an encapsulation of the entire book, in my opinion. Verse 5 of chapter 1. The purpose of my instruction is that all believers would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and a genuine faith. Well, that blows my logic out the door, right? This is the purpose. Why does he not care about any of that junk? Because it doesn't lead to anything that gives edification to people. It doesn't set anybody free. If anything, it chains them up. So he says, the purpose of this is that all believers will be filled with love that comes from a pure heart and a clear conscience and genuine faith. Um, I used to live in Russellville, Kentucky, uh, way back before I was married, all the way back uh, in the 90s. And I stayed there because my aunt was living there, and uh, I, I, was, uh, I didn't know it at the time, but Russellville actually has a really neat history spiritually. Um, the Second Great Awakening was actually started by the, uh, some meetings that happened there that sparked the Red River Meeting House, and it really spawned on. But the Second Great Awakening actually kind of had its birth spot in Russellville, Kentucky. But if you go there, it is a very, very typical Kentucky town. Uh, nothing remarkable about it. Except for when I went there, you could not drink the water. Uh, they had something called hematoids in them. And the reason they had them is, is what happened is they had some new leadership take over and they realized the, something's wrong with the water. And they sent scuba divers down to look at these giant city water filters and they took them out there and they had not been changed probably in decades. And these were probably, you know, good hundred thousand dollars worth of funds had went in uh, hundreds of thousand dollars went into the f city funds to replace them yet they never got replaced for some reason and so uh, they had to go in there and they had to clean out all these filters then they had to put the new f or not clean out take them out there and they had to put new filters in they had to let the filters go through and clean the water then they get those and, and clean those filters and get it to it finally where the city water was drinkable without boiling it I didn't even watch that. I, I first learned about uh, hand sanitizer way before all of you guys. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was ahead of you guys on Purell back in the 90s. What does that have to do with what we're talking about here? What was he doing? He was telling them, basically, you have to go in there, and all this stuff that's diluting and polluting, you've got to figure out. You've got to get rid of this crap. You've got to put something in there. You've got to get time and filter out what's good, or filter out what's bad, so they can start to consume pure things. So what they're looking at is Timothy expo had to expose that stuff and make the water drinkable again. Love poured from a cleansed heart, untainted conscience, unhypocritical faith. That had to come out of Timothy before they could know what the real was when all they've been drinking is the sludge. And so that's where it was. The purpose of my instruction is that all believers would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart. The heart starts with... Where did it come from first? The thing about... The thing about Christianity is people reach people. Very few times you hear, I just decided to read a Bible and I got saved. Somebody told me about, or somebody had me watch, or somebody said this, or I saw this person on... It's never just cold and impersonal. You get that pure love coming from somebody else reaching you and you get thirsty for the real thing. And that's what he's telling them here. So, it says, but some people have missed this whole point. Verse 6. They have turned away from these things and spend their time in meaningless discussions. He's back to this. This doesn't matter. <laughs> they want to be known as teachers of the law of Moses, but they don't know what they're talking about. Even though they speak so confidently. Uh, we know that the law is good when used correctly. The law is basically a flashlight to show the hematoids. It still doesn't remedy the hematoids. Those little bugs in the water, right? Um, so in the, right, in the right aspect, it's good. Um, but the Florida law was not intended for people who do what is right, but it was, for intended, it was for people who are lawless and rebellious, who are ungodly and sinful, who consider nothing sacred and defile what is holy, who kill their father and mother or commit murders. There are a lot of people in our society that, that 
the laws for today. Shine a light on what they are called to be and what they are so they can see the difference. It's a mirror. And verse 10 is a controversial one because, just because it's very bold truth. The law is for people who are sexually immoral or who practice homosexuality or are sex traders, liars. Wow, liars. That's, there's, a, there's a book I read called Respectable Sins about lying and selfishness. These are still sin. These still offend God's pure heart promise breakers, or who, listen to this last one, or who do anything else, anything else that contradicts wholesome teaching. Anything else. You can be confident and bold that in this culture, if they say something's right and it contradicts the Bible, that it's not right. The Bible is our compass. The Bible is our true north. The Bible is our bedrock. There are times where we use the sword of the Spirit to fight off things, but there are times we have to drive it into the ground Wrap ourselves to it so we don't slide off a slimy, slimy ledge. We anchor ourselves to that word. There's times to know when that is and when that isn't. But what we do know is the word is always preeminent. The word is always first. The word is always right. So, Timothy had to <clears throat> take on this task there. How am I doing on time? That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, okay. So um, I'm going to keep going on here. First Timothy 18 and 20, through 20. Timothy, my son, here are my instructions for you. He keeps on going there, based on the prophetic words spoken about you earlier. Now, when we look at Second Timothy, you get to see a contrast that's pretty cool. Uh, May they help you fight the Lord's battles. Cling to your faith. Keep your conscience clear. For some people have deliberately violated their conscience. We are definitely seeing that right now. As a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. Hemonias, an example, or two examples. I threw them out and handed them over to Satan so they might learn not to blaspheme God. Faith and good conscience are two separate weapons mentioned here. You don't hear them called weapons, but they are what protect you. Faith and good conscience. These two travel together. The strength in one gives you strength in the other. If you don't have a clear conscience, you don't have much faith. If you don't have much faith, you're not going to have a clean conscience and clear conscience for long. <coughs> failure in one also leads to failure in the other. And violating your conscience absolutely destroys your faith. Your conscience is like a net that keeps things out that aren't supposed to be out and keeps things in that are supposed to stay in. And when you go in there, it's like a person that's on the trapeze and they fall, the conscience keeps them safe and all that. How crazy would they be to say, I wish this net would quit catching me and they go and start and then go back to the high and the next time they fall damage is done we see people who are intentionally attacking morals and absolutes and truths in their culture and they're shipwrecking themselves without realizing it and we need to be lovingly saying hey this is not the way I see where you're going nothing ends well and it's not because I'm trying to be judgmental or trying to be hateful everything's attached to hate and, and a phobia of some sort I just love you and I want what's best for you. How, I, I, heard, <laughs> I heard this from an atheist. He said one of the reasons he doesn't buy into Christianity is because people aren't zealous enough for it. He said, if you really believe what you're saying, he said, how, if I saw, it's like you would see somebody getting ready to get hit by a bus and you knew it was going to happen, but you didn't want to offend them by pushing them out of the way. He said, how much would someone have to hate me to not tell me about God if they really believe that was the only way to heaven? And then you're sitting there going, whew, it's a little hot in here. <laughs> we are supposed to be people who spread it, and by, spread it by living it. And this is why he says, you've got to live a pure life, and you've got to pour out what you have. You've got to protect the word, you've got to protect the gospel with them, but you also have to spread it. You can't just protect it, go and start a commune over here in the middle of nowhere with, you know, me, Ma, Pa, and our six cousins over here. That's not what he's talking about. There's a counterculture where you're living in the culture, but you're, living, but you're, not, you're, not, you're not compromising to the culture. You're reaching the culture by being a light. It's as dark as it is out now. Light should shine brighter than ever. <sighs> All right. So, 
real quick, I'm talk about the leadership qualifications he talked about there is a big part of Timothy and Titus. Uh, he talks about leaders should be above reproach, faithful to their wife, exercise self-control, live wisely, have a good reputation, hospitable, able to teach, uh, not a heavy drinker, violent, not violent, must be gentle, not quarrelsome, not love money, manage their own family well, not be a new believer. Outsiders, not 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 necessarily just outsiders should speak well in other words they have a clear reputation it doesn't mean that people who are hating on because of this but they don't have any cracks no lack of integrity the word of integrity means no cracks it's a nautical term if you think of a boat and it has integrity that means there's no cracks in it if you have a big crack in the hole it doesn't have integrity you don't want to take that out in the ocean you guys like fishing i don't think you'd want to take a butt out with no integrity <laughs> Paul's saying you're going to have storms, you're going to be out in the deep water, don't have any cracks in your hole. And leaders you appoint don't need to have cracks in their hole either. And he goes on and talks about their uh, other things there, but we're going to move on quick here. A lot of things that I'm going to skip for time's sake. Um, but I want to end with this. He talks about the problem of false teaching is not going to go away anytime soon. If Timothy was going to effectively lead the church in Ephesus, he must begin by putting the house in order. It's not just cleaning house, but you have to clean house and put house. The people, a lot of times Christians make the mistake of leaving vacuums. You, you, know, how to break a, a, you know how to break a bad habit? is to replace it with a good habit. You can't just stop doing something bad. If you leave a vacuum, it's going to come right back. Just like you move... You move and create a little hole in the sand. What happens as soon as the first wave comes back? It's filled up again. And with this, you need to get the impurity and the false teaching. You need to replace it with the right teaching, with moral integrity, and build up things and build in and pour into people. And that's what that was about. Um, all right, and I'm going to move into Titus. Titus, there's a little known about Titus. We talked about it. He's a co-laborer with Paul. Uh, he was given one of Paul's most difficult assignments and delicate assignments to represent the apostle, uh, represent him in the troubled church of Corinth, and that went that was a rough thing. He went well, but then Titus was left in Crete, as we talked about earlier, sometime between Paul's Roman mission trips or, or, or Roman imprisonments. I meant sorry uh, to further work that he and Paul had begun together. So this was an island with a bunch of different ports, but this was there's still a term we use in our modern vernacular called a Cretan. That's not a favorable term. If you want to tell, call somebody a Cretan, you're saying they're basically a no good lion dog, a Cretan. That came from that time frame and that society. The, uh, most of the men were mercenaries that were uh, basically go to the highest bidder. Most of the inner cities, it was an island, most of the inner cities were not safe to go through. They're very sexually immoral and very violent. But yet there are also a lot of influential coastal cities and ports that Paul saw as the perfect place to establish churches and spread the gospel. This is what he sent Titus into. And so he told Titus in there, um, Titus went through there and uh, he put everything in order. He didn't just have one church like Timothy. He had to go to place to place and establish leaders there. So he gave him a similar list to Timothy to set up what kind of leaders to look for. But then he also said, hey, just the, just the church members in general, the men should live this way, the women should look this way, and this is how older men, men should deal with younger men and younger women, and so on and so forth. He basically said, hey, you need to spell it out for them. This is what normal looks like. I, I go back to when I talk about when I was younger, I was in a, in a home that uh, had a lot of rough stuff going on, a lot of things going on. I've, I've seen some things there, and I'm thinking, I first I was a young Christian, and I read about Solomon, and I started praying for wisdom. I said, Lord, I don't know what the right way to be is. I just know what I see is in it. And what he's walking into is that. They, don't, they wouldn't know the right way if it, if it hit him in the face. And so Paul said, hit him in the face with it. <laughs> okay? And that's where they're at with this. And so he had to go from town to town, church to church, and establish leaders to hit these qualifications. Then he would teach them and he would talk to the congregation, this is how you need to go there. He had to teach them basic things like work ethic and all these things. And guess what they also dealt with? False teaching. Uh, the thing about in that area, false teachers could command a pretty penny. And so there was always a lot of false motivations for them. 
And then there they also had to deal with some of the Jewish beliefs and circumcision, things like that. So they had even more messes to go in there. And they had to go through and clean out the water filters and show them pure water just like Ty Timothy did. Except it was probably even a taller order. Um, there's a reference to church leadership through there, but uh, how am I doing time-wise? Okay, so the book is mainly about teaching. Paul concern, uh, is concerned that Titus himself, as well as others appointed, would promote the kind of living that promotes that health, healthy lifestyle. He had to promote it. Again, there's a big thing about not just protecting the faith, protecting the gospel, protecting the integrity of the Word of God and moral purity, but also spreading the gospel while you're doing it. We don't need to circle the wagons like the Old West and just hope the Indians go away. In our culture, we need to protect and just rightly speak, speak loud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trunk, but let the truth be heard. You do it in love, but you reach people. The goal of correction is to recover the one in error, not to win. We don't care about winning. We get ours, if we don't get ours here, we'll get ours eventually. Eternity is a long time. God can make up for lost time. Purity is a matter of internal and not external, as he talks about in this. Outside cannot corrupt inside if the inside is pure. But if the inside is corrupt, nothing outside can, can be anything but polluted by it. Inside is a very big focal point of, of Titus there. Wholesome teaching goes on through there. Um, and I'm going to have to move on here. Um, but there's a veneer of civilization that he talks about obscures the bleak truth that the slightest crack in the surface of society uh, just lifts the facade off. And this summer we seen when you take a little bit of that, we had riots, we had destruction, we had unrest. We see what the world looks like when you take that veneer of civility away just for a little bit. And people without Jesus, how they go. And this is what he had all around him. And he said, hey, it's time to go out there and speak the truth in love. All right, so um, we're going to move on here. I'm not even going to read the summer here. I want to get to 2 Timothy real quick. What am I? Three and a half. Three and a half. Okay, 2 Timothy was likely written during his imprisonment right before he was beheaded. Uh, given that Paul believed the end of his life was near, it's not surprising to hear him talk about his end as being poured out like an offering to God. Now, he talked about, this is continuing his talking to Timothy, who's still at Ephesus, and you can and and the thing that went there is it went from like you heard in First Timothy he said you know the gifts given to you when people when many people laid hands on you he talks about remember when the gift I laid my hands on you are and I can't help but think about he's in his giving years and I could see him like Dr. Lester Sermol just laying hands on just just passing on what he had to the next generation and Timothy's the one who got that lightning bolt from hey I don't want to take this with me and so he's saying that. Uh, he, he, Paul desired to pass the torch of his ministry in Ephesus on to Timothy in a final charge to be bold witness for the gospel. Um, the theme is unashamed faithfulness to the gospel and ministry. He said, if you get whether you have attacks, whatever, be bold and spread the gospel. Don't compromise. Um, then we got it on here. Uh, I'm going to go through real quick and talk about there's a ministry of multiplication introduced in there where he talked about teach to others so they can teach to others. In other words, it's like a candle. You light a candle, they can light a candle, pass it on, multiply. Um, basically, there's a lot in this about not fighting over words. Our culture could really take a cue from that. Don't worry about words. Don't fight over words. And be a worker. This is where it talks about the last days and other things like that. But here's what I want to... Um, I want to stand here as Paul's looking at, at face head on into eternity and he ends with this to Timothy. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. So Timothy was to devote himself to the gospel ministry and emulate Paul. 
that is what I want to be able to say at the end. I have poured, I've, I've lived my life, now i poured it out to the next generation. I have fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. People watching, people here, I challenge you, keep the faith and spread it. Keep the faith and spread it. We have a legacy. We have a legacy that started with Paul to Timothy that still carried on to us. If God did would not want it passed on to you, it would not be in the Word of God. No matter what the culture says, pushes back, screams at you, truth will cry out like a giant if you let it inside of you. And I want to encourage you guys to be bold and not shrink back and to let these epistles speak to you those, those truth there of not letting false teaching and, and twisting of the truth pollute you. And while you're protecting the truth and the purity of it, spread it. Alright? I think we'll stop there. Alright.